Okay. So welcome and thank you everyone for joining our Managing Your Workforce Through the Current Political Climate webinar. Everyone right now is in listen only mode. If you have any questions throughout the program, please feel free to use that Q&A section located on the right side of your WebEx window. We'll do our best to get to everyone's questions at the end if we have some extra time. For those of you who are interested in CLE credit, we'll have an attendance verification code read during the presentation. So please make sure to write that code down since it won't be repeated and is required for CLE credit. The CLE credit submission instructions, presentation recording, and the slide deck will all be distributed to the attendees in the days following the presentation. So just a little outline of what we plan to cover. Oh, and I skipped over that legal disclaimer, of course. This isn't legal advice, and if you have any specific questions, we highly recommend that you contact your favorite attorney to make sure to talk through any of the nuances that apply with these situations. All right, so as far as the objectives go, this is a brief outline of everything we're going to cover today. We're going to start off talking about just generally first amendment protections in the workplace, what applies, what doesn't, and then we will cover political and social justice speech in the workplace as well. And as everyone knows, this is a very timely topic at the moment. We will also cover some rationales for limiting workplace speech. What are some pros? What are some cons to putting limitations on what your employees can say at work? And then how the NLRA applies to any politically charged conduct as well. We will cover some of the nuances of California law because of course California likes to keep it interesting. So we have some of our own rules that apply to this type of speech at work. And then we will end talking about how to manage employee communications to make sure we are maximizing productivity and keeping morale high in the workplace. A lot of what we're going to be going over are just kind of what are legitimate reasons to be limiting workplace speech? What are some pros? What are some cons? So we are going to cover a lot of the considerations um, in this topic. Right now, there are kind of two main movements that are impacting employers, and they kind of are fighting against each other. As you can see, on the one hand, we have reverse discrimination, discrimination lawsuits, which we've been seeing, as well as political speech. And then on the other hand, there's been an increased focus on diversity and inclusion efforts, um, shareholder lawsuits that have been occurring, um, a lot of pay equity reporting issues, and California just signed their own pay equity reporting law last fall, and that first reporting is coming up in March, so that's going to be big. And then finally, a lot of political and social justice speech issues. For those of you who aren't aware, ESG means environmental, social, and corporate governance. We're not going to be going into that in detail today because you could just have a whole presentation just on that itself, but um, we just wanted to kind of include that on here as well. So there's a lot of questions about what can an employer do, what can't an employer do, and when can action be taken? So these are just some hypotheticals that we're presenting of when can an employer actually take action based on these actions by employees. For example, if an employee refuses to take off a Make America Great Again baseball cap after they clock into work, so they're on work time. Can an employer take action if that happens? Similarly, if an employer refuses to stop wearing a Black Lives Matter mask to team meetings, again, that would be on work time. Um, can an employer take action if that occurs? And then finally, what about displaying political posters, political buttons? We just finished one election, and I saw someone earlier mention that midterms are already coming up next year, and it seems like we haven't even finished one election and there's another one coming. So these are going to consistently be issues that are coming up at work, and especially with the pandemic, stress is heightened uh, for everyone right now, and so tensions are a little bit higher at work and outside of work. So the question is, when can employees be free to express their views around the water cooler or virtually around the water cooler? And then what can be regulated and how can it be regulated? So we want to go over some of the practical and legal considerations to keep in mind. So 
other considerations that are going to come into play when determining whether or not you can limit speech is whether it's a public or private employer. So an employer's ability to limit workplace, workplace speech really depends on the type of employer it is, and that will guide how many limitations exist. So there's no bright line rule about how much can be regulated and how the speech can be regulated itself. We have to look at a variety of laws, including looking at the First Amendment, reviewing California law, the National Labor Relations Act, and then any other anti-discrimination, anti-retaliation laws that might apply. So now I will pass it over to Mike, who will discuss free speech at work. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Mike Wallander. I am a partner in our San Francisco office. Um, so as, as Sharday mentioned, um, the one of the topics that comes up quite a bit here and a starting point here in, in this sphere is, is the First Amendment. Um, the, the good thing for private employers is that um, it, it generally doesn't apply to you um, because it applies to uh, the government employers, uh, public employers. Um, the, the one exception would be if a state law incorporates First Amendment standards into its own state laws. California is not one of them. Um, <clears throat> but uh, for, for those employers that do need to be concerned about the First Amendment at work, um, typically, there is a, uh, a balancing test um, where it balances the employee's right to comment on a matter of public concern against the state's role as uh, the employer and its interest in providing public services uh, effective, effectively and efficiently. Um, so that, that's the general. We've had there, – there are some specific cases and some roles might require some kind of political loyalty where um, political positions have come into play. Um, th there is a case that came out of the Fifth Circuit um, in Texas that ruled that a Texas district attorney, the elected official, didn't violate the First Amendment by, fi by firing the coordinator of his crime victims unit um, for having different political beliefs. And, and the court found it was okay because the employee's job required for political affiliations and positions to align with the district attorneys. Um, it used that balancing test. Um, <clears throat> so as I mentioned, though, uh, employers do not need to um, be as concerned about that, or private employers do not need to be as concerned about the, the First Amendment. So well, one of the things we hear a lot um, it is, from, from employees is, is, well, these are my First Amendment rights. Well, we're, we're a private employer. The First Amendment doesn't apply. Um, so one thing as well to be um, uh, concerned about here, too, is that uh, y you'll want to uh, be cognizant of your EEO policies. Employees might complain about discrimination or harassment or um, workplace safety violations and things like that. Um, and that's fine. Um, but if those policies are violated, there, there obviously is no freedom or right to express these racist or sexist or discriminatory comment, discriminatory comments in the workplace because of the, the EEO laws. Um, so on the next slide, um, we have our first polling question. And that question is, does your company have a political speech policy? Um, <clears throat> what we've seen in practice is that it's become a very company-specific decision as to whether or not you have a policy. Um, there are some companies that have blanket policies that say you can't discuss political issues at work. There are some that say don't have anything, and you say you can talk about anything. Um, there are others that fall in the middle. And, and really where we are, uh, or really where you, where you land, depends a lot on your own company's culture and um, what your company, um, you know, finds important for, it, uh, you know, for, for its own workplace. Um, so uh, we're, we're waiting for some answers here. Um, and... I, we don't have the numbers yet. Um, 
Oh, now we can. Okay. So uh, it's interesting here. So we have uh, the no is 73% and the yes is 13%. Um, and uh, that, that's uh, an, interesting, uh, an interesting number. Um, I think last time we did this presentation, we were a little bit uh, more on the yeses, but um, uh, on the next slide, we can talk about uh, times when employers might be looking at controlling speech outside of the workplace. Um, it comes out a lot. Uh, you, you may have an employee, and we've seen a lot of examples in the, in the news recently um, with various employees uh, making comments that were deemed uh, racist or um, things of that nature, and you saw those employees being fired. Well, here, here are some times where employers may, may be able to control speech um, outside of the workplace, and that's when you know, the speech impacts the employer's business. There might be social media posts that you know, are harassing, offensive, or threatening. Um, uh, you know, again, speech or, or social media posts that might bring negative attention to the, the employer. Um, another thing to look at, too, when you're the employer um, uh, and making a decision about uh, whether or not you want to get involved with the employee's actions outside of work um, is uh, whether or not you think that that conduct violated your own EEO or your anti-harassment or anti-bullying or code of conduct policies. If, those, if they violate those, um, that may provide a, a another means to um, to uh, get involved with the employee. Um, so uh, we have some other examples here too, uh, and um, we'll, we'll get into the employer's right to control um, uh, off-duty conduct in more detail, in particular California um, coming down the road um, later in the presentation. But California has its own, uh, its own statutes in the labor code that uh, involve um, uh, regulating lawful off-duty conduct. Um, so uh, on the next slide, we got our next polling question, and I'll turn it over to Tom. Thanks, Mike. And I, hi, everybody. Happy New Year. Uh, I'm Tom Posey. I'm a partner in Labor and Employment Group, and I've got our second polling question for you. Uh, this question is, has your company taken a public stance on a political issue? So if you want to click yes or no on that one. We, we originally were going to ask, are you wearing pajama pants or sweats right now on this slide? But we realized our own answers might accidentally become public and we didn't want to have to say that. So we, we changed this one at the last minute. So uh, while everybody's answering that, let's just talk a little bit about what happens if you do take a public stance on a political issue at your company. So you, uh, you certainly enjoy the right to speak and control uh, your own message as an employer regarding matters of public concern. But you have to remember that while you're free to control your own message and put limits, potentially put limits on the way political expression on social justice issues and other questions is happening in the workplace, you still need to avoid imposing any requirements on employees to accept or endorse the kinds of messages that you're putting out yourself as a company. Now, if, if you do take a stance as an employer, there's, there's several practical considerations. If you do take a, a public stance on a political issue, there's several political, sorry, several practical <laughs> considerations that you need to keep in mind. Now, it looks like from our poll responses here, uh, about a third of you have, your company has taken a public stance on a political issue. So we've got about 35% of you said yes, 57% said no, the other 8%, maybe you're apolitical, so the company's not doing anything on that. But so roughly about a third of, of our participants here, your, your company's taken a stance. So let's talk about some of the practical considerations for those of you who've done that or those of you who haven't yet who might be considering it. Let's go to that next slide, please. First, if, if you have taken a public stance on some political issue, you, and some of this is, I'm sure, stating the obvious, but you're more likely to have employees who are going to want to discuss that stance or potentially other politically charged subjects that relate to it. Now, it's obviously easy for those kind of discussions to get pretty heated. So as you're navigating how you do your, your messaging and approach these issues, just uh, be careful that 
you're not potentially lighting a match on the powder keg here for, for employees to start discussions that maybe you don't want taking place in the workplace. Related to that, another consideration is the, the morale and the culture of, of your company, both overall and at, at your specific office or facility or location. Now, you're certainly going to want to think about having different policies or maybe allowing or encouraging different messages if you're operating a hotel or a restaurant that's closed or, or partially closed right now where you've got very limited staffing versus maybe a shipping business where you're just overflowing right now, everybody's working overtime and, and it's bustling. So that those kind of things you should consider from a practical perspective as to whether and how that should influence the, the public stances you're taking and how you're limiting or not limiting uh, employees' conduct related to it. Now, the last bullet up here, we talk about creating a safe space that encourages freedom of thought. Now, I, I know sometimes that term can put people off that if we're making a safe space and we're all going to hold hands and no one's going to say anything bad about anyone else. And it, it doesn't have to mean that. It, it's not that innocuous. But uh, really what it comes down to is just making sure in the workplace that since the, the primary consideration is everybody's supposed to be working. It, it's not a public debate. It's, it's not a, an opinion program that you're watching after work. It, it's your workplace. So you want to, to whatever degree, you're going to allow that kind of discussion to go on, make sure that you've got a space where employees feel that they can express their views without facing any sort of discrimination or harassment or any unlawful conduct directed towards them for doing that. So uh, we started talking a little bit about whether and how you can restrict employees' speech or conduct related to these issues. So I'm going to turn it back over to Chardet to walk us through some of those points. Okay, so as far as restricting or allowing speech, there is no really right or wrong answer. There is certain benefits and um, risks that come with either one. So as far as practical implications of restricting speech, one of the main ones that you might see would be bad publicity. I'm sure everyone has seen the news articles of various companies who are kind of shunned in the media for quote unquote restricting the speech of their employees. For example, um, last summer, Whole Foods was sued when it wasn't allowing employees to wear Black Lives Matter masks, and it was claimed that it was discriminatory or being treated unfairly because the company could support LGBTQ, but not support BLM. So nowadays, with the way everything spreads quickly on social media and throughout the media, there's a risk of bad publicity that comes from employees being upset if they feel like their speech is being limited. Another potential implication is bad employee morale. If employees feel like they want to have the freedom to discuss issues of importance to them with their colleagues, um, that might lead to some poor morale if there are some restrictions being placed on speech. But again, as Tom mentioned before, it's first and foremost a workplace. So you don't want it to just be a free for all because a lot of this um, speech can end up getting distracting because it does lead to a lot of controversy between employees. Another implication of restricting workplace speech would be potential employee protests. So if employees feel like they're not able to discuss these issues and they want to discuss them at work, they may start protesting either the rules that are being applied to them or the company in general saying that they are their speech is being limited and again as tom said a lot of people now will say well my first amendment rights are being limited but again that's not going to apply to private companies so there is a misunderstanding in the general public of what rules actually apply and what is permissible and because of that misunderstanding sometimes that could lead to additional complications with employees. A few other tips if you do want to restrict workplace speech. One is just acknowledging difficult moments. Throughout the past year, especially, there have been a number of very large scale events that have happened. And like I mentioned earlier, the pandemic is 
kind of increasing everyone's stress levels. So one way to handle this, if you are going to restrict workplace speech is to acknowledge that something big happens that's really going to affect your workplace. So you're recognizing that it's occurring, but that doesn't mean that it's going to have to lead into a significant conversation that's going to take away from the good work that's being done. Another option, as Tom mentioned, is to create a safe space for these conversations. That would allow it to be kind of in more of a controlled environment, and it would have a specific, you know, date, time, or place that this is going to occur. And then otherwise everyone, you know, is expected to work, expected to be focusing on work. So that's another alternative if you want to give some space for these types of conversations, but don't want it to take up away from what's going on at work or cause any controversy or issues between employees. And then finally, you can reward allyship. So there are ways to recognize things that are going on and employees having these conversations with again, without being distracting. So if you do see something good that's happening or a good way that speech is taking place, that's something that can be recognized again, without kind of taking away from your day to day business, because that is one of the main challenges that employers have that when all of the speech is allowed, inevitably, there are going to be disagreements and it could lead to bad working relationships because not everyone is going to agree with everything, especially if you work in a big company, there's no way everyone is going to agree with each other. So that's a risk that comes with allowing um, workplace speech. And that kind of leads us over to the implications of allowing workplace speech. So some speech or expression that might be classified as unlawful harassment, of course, you have to know that that would be prohibited. So even if you're going to allow certain speech to occur, you still have policies to abide by and there are still laws to abide by. So to the extent you're allowing speech to take place, you have to make sure that no policies or laws are being violated. Just because you're allowing employees to engage in the speech doesn't mean they can engage in harassing actions or discriminatory actions against their colleagues or people at work. Um, we have just an example up here of a person who is wearing a Make America Great Again hat, filing a lawsuit against an employer claiming that a black employee unlawfully harassed him for wearing that hat. And these types of situations are really common nowadays because you see a lot of instances of people wearing messages either on their face masks or face coverings or wearing messages on shirts or on hats or on buttons. So this is something that you know, you're seeing very commonly that you know what someone's political affiliation is or where they stand on a political or social justice position. Um, it also leads to a lot of tension between coworkers because, as I mentioned, not everyone is going to be able to agree on every single topic. So that is just a realistic implication of allowing speech that you know that this type of thing is going to occur. There's going to be some disagreements in the workplace and you don't want these disagreements to lead to more of a toxic work environment or lead to a situation where the employees can't even work with each other because they have had so many disagreements about their political or social justice views. So that is a challenge because we want to make sure that everyone is able to continue working harmoniously. And if you're allowing workplace speech, sometimes things get a little bit heated and then that can lead to problems later on. Um, according to a survey conducted last year, almost half of working Americans have personally had a political disagreement at work. And that's not really surprising. You know, you've had political disagreements probably with family members, with friends, with just other members of the general public. So it's just a realistic occurrence that if this speech is taking place at work, some disagreement is going to take place. And so you'll want to know from the beginning what's going to be the best way to approach those issues that come up and how you're going to want to handle them. Again, it needs to be analyzed on a case by case basis because you have to make sure there's no harassing or discriminatory or other illegal conduct occurring. But you will want to have some sort of game plan about how you can kind of handle these issues. And again, that's another implication with allowing speech is if these issues are arising, that's going to take time out of the day to then have to figure out how you're going to be resolving these issues when they do come up. Okay, so now I will pass it back to Tom to talk a little bit about the NLRA. 
Thanks. I, I thought this was actually supposed to be poll question number three, which was what's the highest number of episodes of Cobra Kai that you've watched in one sitting. Uh, but I guess we took that one out. So if you want to just email us those numbers on your own, we can compile them and we can maybe announce the winner later this week of who's watched the most in a row. I, I think mine is five, but it wasn't last night. So I, I won't be falling asleep during the presentation here. Uh, all right, so let's let's talk about political speech and, and the NLRA, the National Labor Relations Act. Now, speaking generally, political speech usually does not raise any LRA, NLRA concerns, but it can. There's multiple statutes, including the NLRA and Cal OSHA, that protect employees, whether you're union or non-union, from being disciplined from, for discussing your work conditions. So that's wages, hours, scheduling, those kind of things. Now, this has been established as a fundamental public policy. Similarly, if there's a hazardous condition at work, it's, it's dangerous to be in the workplace. The employee has an absolute right to make a verbal complaint about the working environment because that promotes health and safety. Conversely, though, a, a political opinion isn't deemed to have the same level of public benefit or protecting those opinions and the expression of those opinions at work isn't deemed to have the same public benefit. Now, the, the, my favorite quote on this is from Oliver Wendell Holmes, is that you have a constitutional right to talk politics, but you don't have a constitutional right to be employed. So that's not going to get the same level of protection when you're at work to engage in that kind of speech. There's protections, but they're, they're just not as absolute and consider things like the employer's right to maintain goodwill. So you have to be cautious about political speech policies you impose that seem neutral on their face, but might disproportionately restrict a, a certain class of people. So if you look about the middle of the slide here, we talk about if you've got a general ban on slogans or logos on apparel or buttons, that can be uh, unlawful under Section 7, absent special circumstances. But really where, where you want to look here is whether you're being consistent and whether you have something that's generally applicable to all employees or not. So if you're going to say we're restricting Black Lives Matter uh, apparel, but we're not restricting Make America Great Again apparel or vice versa, that's where you're certainly going to run into some issues because you don't have a generally applicable policy and you're, you're picking and choosing between different groups or potentially different ideologies. Can you go to that next slide, please? Oh, sorry, I think you're muted. The, the CLE code, you think which after is, doing is this for what everybody wants year, to get. I would unmute myself. <laughs> um, <laughs> so now we have the CLE code. It is SS8701. So that's SS as in Cypress Shaw. SS8701. Okay, thanks. And before everybody reaches over and clicks to log off, you don't know whether there's another poll question, but we might know if you do that. So you need to stay on even though you've gotten the code now. Uh, all right, so just a little bit more about uh, the NLRA and from the National Labor uh, Relations Board's perspective. Now, that they're going to interpret protected concerted activity broadly to include activity for political purposes. But protected concerted activity is only protected if first it's got a direct nexus to your working condition, so just two employees talking, that in and of itself isn't protected. We, we've got to be talking about acting in concert to do something that's for our mutual aid and benefit relating to directly to our working conditions. Now, it, that also needs to be something where the employer can somehow control the objective of the activity. Two employees who are saying, well, we, we're engaging in concerted activity and discussing the country's politics for, for our mutual benefit. That, that's not something that's protected under the National Labor Relations Act or that the NLRB is going to enforce or hold there's been an unfair labor practice charge if, if we're restricting that because that doesn't relate to the, the employee's working conditions or things that we as the employer can control. Now, we've been talking a lot about what happens when you're on duty and what controls and restrictions you can put in place. So I'm going to turn it over to Mike to talk a little bit about off-duty protections for employees in California. Great. Thanks, Tom. Um, so uh, on, on this slide, we're talking about off-duty protections for employees in California. Um, and, and to backtrack a little bit, we, we've talked about the First Amendment. 
we've talked about the NLRB, we've talked about OSHA laws. There's a, it, and th those are the starting places when we're talking about um, uh, the employer's ability to regulate political speech. But then another important place to start too is your geography and your location. Um, because various states have very different laws about um, how they treat this. Some don't do anything. Um, some only treat very traditional notions of like voting behavior. Um, others go much more further into it, like California, for example, um, and uh, regulate um, the employer's ability to uh, essentially impose its view on employees. Um, <clears throat> so with respect to off-duty conduct, um, as I mentioned, there's a variety of different approaches, but those states that do delve into this area, um, they prohibit discrimination and retaliation based off of lawful off-duty conduct. So if they're outside of work and they're doing something that's legal, um, and, and when it comes up here in the political sphere, then um, typically we might be thinking about participating in a march, for example. Just going ahead and marching and exercising your First Amendment right, um, not breaking any laws, employer can't do anything about that. Um, if you are doing something that might be deemed unlawful during those, uh, those demonstrations, the employer could do something about that. Um, those are the general parameters. Um, and, and California is no different there. California prohibits discrimination and retaliation based off of lawful off-duty conduct. It's Labor Code Section 96K and Labor Code Section 98.5. Um, now, those statutes aren't unfettered, and there are no, there aren't, um, they're not unlimited. So the employer can uh, can regulate employee conduct. There's some case law that um, suggests that when the employer has a legitimate business reason, that sounds very familiar to uh, our other uh, discrimination laws. But when the employer has a legitimate business reason, um, it can uh, it, it can delve into that. Um, so uh, that, that's off-duty conduct. Now, on the next slide, we'll get into um, on-duty conduct in California. California um, has uh, two main statutes. The main one right here is Labor Code 1101, um, which prohibits employers from uh, making policies um, preventing this, the first part is more general from participating in politics or becoming uh, candidates for public office. Um, the second part is um, controlling or directing your political activities or affiliations of employees. Um, so this, this statute is, is aimed at preventing the employer from exercising its economic influence over the employee um, to uh, adopt a certain political view. It's aimed at preserving the employee's um, uh, right to have their own views. Um, there's a second statute here um, that uh, is not on the slide, um, but that's Labor Code 1102, which says that the employer cannot fire an employee for engaging in political activity. Um, so we've seen this term political activity and um, you might be thinking, well, what is that? Um, it covers traditional notions like voting and supporting a candidate, things like that, running for office. Um, the, the courts have given us two definitions um, that uh, have been pretty broad. Um, the first one, which is back in the 40s, was um, that political activity was conduct related to the orderly conduct of government. Um, and then in the 70s, we got another Supreme Court case um, that said political activity is the espousal of a candidate or cause, so supporting a candidate or cause, in some degree to, um, of action to promote the acceptance of it by others. So again, that's very broad. Um, it's been interpreted to cover, for example, support of the LGBT, LBG, LGBTQ movement. Um, and uh, it, the, the, the interesting thing about this area of law is that there's actually not a lot of case law about it. Um, we did get some guidance uh, 
about seven years ago in a case, um, and, and uh, it was a case uh, involving Prop 8 back then in California, which is California's voter uh, approved proposition, which was a ban on same sex marriage. Um, there is a case where an employee uh, had uh, ripped down a poster that was in the employer's uh, break room and um, was terminated, and uh, he filed a lawsuit for Section 1101 and 1102, claiming that he was discriminated against um, based off of his own political belief. Um, without getting into too much detail in the case, this appellate court found that um, there were enough tribal issues in the record before it that uh, it that they could have a trial. So they denied summary judgment, um, but did make some comments about what what um, reasons for the employer uh, might be legitimate to uh, limit uh, political activity at work. And again, it's very similar to our, our usual um, discrimination analysis. Um, if there's a, a legitimate business reason that's unrelated to political viewpoint, so the key here is, was this action politically motivated? Was the employer trying to, um, to impose its view? Um, because as we mentioned earlier, the employer's completely entitled to have its own political view on the employee. Um, and treating it different, treating the employee differently, or engaging in adverse employment action um, with respect to that employee because of the um, their, their political view. Um, so, if, if for example the reason for termination was destruction of company property, for example, that would have been a legitimate reason. Um, so, uh, with that, um, we can move on to the next slide and move to uh, Tom to talk about responding to. Um, preventing conflicts. Thanks, Mike. So that, now that we've talked a lot about the underlying law and what, what kind of the parameters of what you can and can't do, let, let's talk a little bit about what you can and should do in trying to prevent and respond to some of these conflicts that come up between your employees in the workplace. First and foremost, uh, we think it's it's a good idea to be proactive here. You, you want to have employee and management trainings first on all the relevant policies and especially for the managers on action steps to take in response to these kind of incidents happening in the workplace. So what do we mean by action steps? Well, it, probably the first and most important one is don't overreact. If a couple of employees are getting into maybe a starting to be a heated discussion about something, it, the manager doesn't have to run over and split them apart and make a big deal out of it because maybe that's going to escalate things even further. In general, the, the idea here is that the manager should be trying to keep the workplace moving. It's where we're all here to work and, and there's nothing wrong with, with throughout everything we're talking about here. You're never going to have a problem from a legal perspective saying, hey, everybody stop yapping and get back to work. It's okay to say we're on the clock, go to work. So the, the managers need to understand that, that even though there's a lot of sensitive topics out there right now, that it is still okay to get people back on the job. Now also for the managers, is it's important to make sure that they clearly set forth what the expectations are for employees. The employees need to understand, preferably from the managers and the policies, exactly what is permissible, what we don't want you to be doing in the workplace. Okay. In along lines of being proactive, another thing to consider is whether you want to make some sort of a statement related to what's going on in the world right now. I mean, acknowledging that there's turbulent political and social conditions, underscoring your commitment to policies and practices that are respecting employees and others in the community. Now, you're certainly not required to do that, but quite a few of uh, employers, quite a few of you even on this call have done that. Uh, and so that's something else to consider in taking a proactive stance. Now, from the policy perspective, the, there's a number of policies that it, it's a good idea to pull out your handbook or your, your policy manual and take a look at to make sure that the policies you have in place, one, that they do address the kind of things that we're dealing with right now, and two, that employees are up to speed on those and that if the policy needs to be updated, you do that. And if the policy is up to date, that you make sure employees are up to date on it. They've had their annual review of that, or maybe you need more than an annual review with the climate we have going on. So a, a lot of these up here on the slide are obvious ones and things that we've touched on in some of the examples for your dress code, bulletin boards, 
<coughs> excuse me, email use policies, conduct policies, those are all potentially going to come into play here. So if, if you're taking a proactive stance, you've got your managers empowered and trained to handle these kind of conflicts when they do come up, and you've got solid policies in place that you've edu educated your employees on that address the kinds of issues that these conflicts can, can bring around, then, then you're already several steps ahead of the game. Let's pull up the next slide, please. So a little more on responding to these, these kind of conflicts between employees in the workplace. So one of the biggest things you need to make sure you do as an employer is communicate what the company's policies are regarding political expression. Don't just assume either that everybody knows what the rules are. We handed out a handbook, so you were supposed to read it. You know what you're supposed to do. Especially in our current climate, it makes sense if, if you need to go back with those policies, as we said a minute ago, Make sure that not just for the, the written policies themselves, but just the company's overall stance and position on this, that employees are aware of that. And second, you wanna be careful and make sure that those values are being affirmed by your leadership. If you've got policies that say, we, we've got a respectful workplace and we, we respect everyone's view, and you've got a, a mid-level or senior manager who every time somebody comes into work is telling them, you know, giving them a recap of all their favorite highlights from the news last night and why they're so strongly in favor of one political party versus another or one movement versus another, then that's maybe undermining the larger company-wide methods and policies you have. So, so be aware of that. Again, we talk about creating a safe space to discuss uh, what's going on outside of work, but again, within the context of and tempered against the primary reason we're all here in the workplace is to work. But that said, we understand people are gonna to wanna to talk about things going on outside of the workplace. And so at least we wanna have a space where they can feel comfortable doing that to the degree that we're willing to let those discussions happen before we all get back to work. And lastly, it's just having managers, especially who are trained and feel empowered to redirect any of these difficult conversations to keep them from getting out of hand. Now, if you may have a manager or a supervisor who feels like, okay, well, the, those two are, are arguing about a political issue or arguing about the Black Lives Matter movement and their differing opinions about it. Well, the, the managers or supervisors shouldn't feel like, oh, that, that's illegal. I'm not allowed to step in there. We're, we're gonna get some sort of an unfair labor practice charge or a discrimination charge if I tell them to stop talking about that. The supervisors and managers need to understand that it is okay and perfectly appropriate not to jump in and say, well, hey, here's whose side I'm on in this conversation, but to say, okay, listen, let's, why don't we all just take it down a notch? This, this is something maybe you guys can discuss later on your break or after work. Let's get back to work. So if you're getting a theme here, it's let's go back to work, which is something that it's, it's okay for, for your managers to be telling folks. Go to the next slide, please. So the, the bottom line here is, is that employers can't allow free speech and expression to create a hostile workplace. Now, oftentimes we think of just harassment and hostile workplaces in terms of what individuals are saying, but we also need to consider whether they're displaying symbols that are considered offensive or harassing. So take the Confederate flag, for example, the, the EEOC and, and a number of courts have found that that symbol contributes to a hostile work environment, that it's meant to demean and intimidate and harass. So uh, whatever rules and policies and practices we have in place, we've got to make sure that we're not allowing whatever expression is happening to create a hostile workplace for, for our employees. And again, as, as we said it earlier, it's, it's important that you've got viewpoint neutral policies and the third bullet here, which is in bold, is, is maybe one of the most important points we're gonna make during the whole hour today, is even-handed enforcement of the policies. Consistent and fair application of these policies is your absolute best way to, one, from a legal perspective, protect yourself against any unlawful conduct that, that may be happening. And second, I, to make a better workplace for your employees. If you're if you've got even-handed enforcement of these policies, and again, that you're consistently applying them, not some of the time or most of the time, 
that this applies to everybody and it applies every time this happens, you, you're going to be far better protected than you would otherwise, and you're likely to have a far more productive workplace. So uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to Shard A for a couple concluding points. Just remember that as companies, you, you are a you're free to engage in expression. You're free to take a viewpoint or a position on something if you'd like. But remember that there are EEO concerns and considerations to be aware of. So that's something to consider if you're thinking about taking a position and, you know, of course, carefully drafting what that's going to be. Remember California's restrictions that Mike discussed, because again, California has its own laws that are going to apply aside from federal laws that you'll also want to comply with. Like Tom said, consistency is key. A lot of the times when employees are getting upset about something, aside from the content of what they're discussing with their colleagues, it's because they think something unfair is happening and they're being treated unfairly. So the best way to avoid that, as Tom said, is to make sure everything is being handled consistently, applied consistently, et cetera. And remember to any NLRA concerns that might come up when you're looking at issues that involve speech and these types of discussions at work. And when you're thinking about the kind of dialogue that might be occurring and the differences in the workplace, when people think about diversity, they generally think about gender or they think about race or ethnicity, but remember there's diversity of thought and viewpoint as well. And um, that's maybe even the most common type of diversity because you, have a lot of employees that have a lot of differing views on various issues. So remember that these things come up because a lot of times they're highly emotional and um, emotions charging discussions can sometimes get a little bit difficult. So just kind of keep in mind that you have a diverse workplace and diverse workforce and that's part of the reason these issues can come up. So with that, we will take any questions that we had. Let's see here. Looks like we have a few, and I'm not sure, Tom and Mike, if you can see the questions as well, but I'll read them off, and then whoever wants to take them, feel free to jump in. Okay, there are a few questions about copies of the slide, so all of that will be um, distributed with the recording um, in the days following the webinar. Okay. So, one question was regarding the recent events in Washington, D.C., if an employee is seen attending a rally or a protest but is not visibly identified as being associated to the employer, can the employer take action? And then, what if the employee is wearing an employer-branded piece of clothing? Okay. Um, so, on the first piece of that, I think it's it's important in part to clarify exactly what we're talking about. So we're saying a rally or a protest, and now I know we're saying the recent events in D.C. though too. So if we're looking at the illegal activities that were going on, I mean people actually breaking into the Capitol and you know going into the representatives' offices and such. I, there, I, I don't have any hesitation in saying that we can take action related to that. I mean we're literally on the news watching our employee violate various federal laws. So that, that's, that's not going to be an issue. Um, now, if the employee is wearing an employer-branded piece of clothing, it's, I mean, really, that's going to go back to the same issue here. Whether you're wearing the company logo T-shirt or anything else, if I see you involved in that kind of illegal activity, that, that's not going to be an issue that I have to overlook. And then just another note on that too, I read an article about one employee or one individual who was at the recent events in DC and he was wearing a company ID badge and he was terminated. So again, these things yeah. do happen and if they're engaging in illegal activity, um, you're not required to keep them employed when you have proof of that. Um, next question. You, if you also should, we should note, you should be subject to immediate termination if you're wearing big Viking horns and Chewbacca pants, but I, I think that guy was probably taken care of by his employer as well. So that's, that's not as much <laughs> of a legal issue. Um, next question. If our company takes position on a political matter and is enforcing that position with its customers, can the company restrict its employees from speaking to customers about those issues, for instance? 
the company says all clients must be COVID tested. And then uh, I, an employee the, disagrees. Yeah. I, Mike, you want to take that one or you want me to? Um, sure. Well, so as the employer, I think you can uh, have the employee, you, you can, you can have the employee um, talk about the company's position, but I don't think that um, you can, uh, and you can restrict the employee from, I think, talking about their own position with the client, because that would impact the company's interest with it. Um, at least that, that would be my view, viewpoint of it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the way uh, understanding this question is, you know, the our employees on the phone with one of the customers saying, boy, I, I hate working for these guys. The, these idiots want us all to take a COVID test or something like that. And, you know, I, I think uh, as Mike said, that's, I mean, from an employer's perspective, it's, I, I think that's probably going to be pretty clear what, what you can do there. I mean, and again, it, some of that's even coming back to non, not necessarily political issues. If I, if I'm on with a customer and I say, boy, I'm, you know, I, I just had a meeting with my boss, Mike, what a jerk. I hate working with that guy. Well, that's one, it's a pretty stupid thing to say if you're an employee, but second, it's, um, it, it's not something we as the employer have to let you do. And Tom, there was a related follow-up to that. Are there any implications of all of this on hiring practices? Would it be unlawful to hire someone because they belong to XYZ party or wrote a tweet supporting a candidate? Hmm, that's interesting. So, well, let's look at the tweet question. I mean, if, if we hire someone because of a, they wrote a tweet supporting a candidate and we liked their tweet. I mean, I, I guess generally that that wouldn't necessarily be a problem. I mean, you know, I, I've got tweets that say, go fill in the blank um, person that I, I, candidate I voted for. But I, I think there's potentially larger problems with that, with whatever ideologies or messages are associated with that candidate. If, if somebody's running in, in one of the races and they've had a, a lot of messaging that's deemed to be very racist or sexist, and I've got tweets that say I, I'm 100% behind candidate A. Well, it, I think there's a risk there that somebody looks at that and says I'm 100% behind racism or sexism. So when I, if I'm hiring somebody based on that, that I think would be problematic. But I, and Mike, let me know your thoughts on this. I, I think just if it was just based on the the name of the candidate or I support fill in the blank candidate that on its face isn't really a problem, but there's so much more that would be underlying that, I would think. Yeah, it's it's an interesting question, too, because most of our statutes in California, they, they, they're they already contemplating an employment relationship. And so we're not talking about um, pre-employment. Um, so th that is an interesting question. I, I think if you're going to be on the conservative side of things, I think you would consider the California laws um, when you are hiring. Um, the the law 1102 says you can't demote or fire somebody. So then that, that already also presupposes an employment relationship as well. Um, but if you're going to take a conservative approach, again, there's no case law on that, that piece. Um, it, it's not something that's often litigated. Um, and when it is litigated, it's sort of litigated kind of cyclically when we have our elections. Um, but yeah, I, I would, if you're going to be conservative, I think you, you would think about those, those laws when, um, uh, when making your hiring decisions. But, um, you know, when you take a close look at the statutory language, it may not cover that. Okay, another question. Make America Great Again hats represent a political candidate. So as long as all garb for all political candidates is limited, such as Biden or Make America Great Again, wouldn't that limit the risk considerably, even if BLM, Black Lives Matter, or other garb in support of social movements and allow, is allowed? Yes, that, that would help. Obviously, there's some risk involved if you're letting any type of speech occurring, but if you're limiting the political speech and saying no political speech can take place, yes, of course, that would help limit the risk. There's also... Um, some discussion and thought about 
Black Lives Matter is not being considered political and like you said, being considered social. So that's a consideration as well that comes up when employers are dealing with these issues. Okay, um, should political affiliation be listed in the protected classes in our harassment prevention and EEO policies? Is, um, I can take that. Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, um, well, technically the employees are protected from any sort of discrimination occurring because of their political affiliation. So it would be safe to list that, um, in my opinion, in the policies. Yeah, I think you certainly can list it, um, especially when you're in California. Um, I, I think it's something that you, you certainly can list out there for your employees. Um, may an employer require an employee to choose between holding a political position such as mayor or continuing as an employee? Uh, there actually was a case about that in the Ninth Circuit. Um, it was, and it found that they could. Um, it was a case involving a county supervisor, I believe. Um, the, the company didn't allow that uh, particular employee to continue because of the time commitments involved. Um, and the Ninth Circuit uh, found that that was okay, even under the California laws. Okay, um, I think we have time for a couple more. Uh, one is, can you talk a bit more about the NLRA's application to private employers? For example, more about the general ban. Um, the general ban so I, I guess I, I'll assume for this question, you mean if, if you've got a general ban on political speech in, in the workplace. And so the, the National Labor Relations Act, where, where I think this gets confusing a lot of times, is that the, the whole protected concerted activity piece of when I'm communicating with at least one other employee, one of my coworkers, uh, about uh, some matter of our shared interest and re that's relating to our work conditions, that that's protected. But it's just generally saying, well, we should be able to talk about politics in the workplace because that affects us. And it just gets a little more, I, I mean, philosophical, frankly, the further and further out you go with it, because it's, I mean, certainly discussing politics at work, that absolutely impacts my workplace because depending who gets elected, that's going to have an influence on which way the employment laws go and how they're enforced and, you know, what the minimum wage is going to be and all kinds of other different things. But there, I think the important part is that that's all things outside of the employer's control. So just talking about things that may impact us as employees that the employer can't in any way do much of anything about, that's not going to be protected speech or conduct that we can engage in. So I, I think that's what's really going to make the delineation there is it's probably, if I'm understanding the, crest, the question right, this is stuff that's going to be outside of the employer's control, that they can't do anything about it, and also that it, it's only going to be very tangentially related to my day-to-day -day working conditions as opposed to just if things change in society, my work conditions will be different technically. Okay, and then we'll take this as the last question. Are employees see safe space as meaning that anything they raise will not need to be investigated if they refer to events in the workplace? How do we create a safe space while protecting the firm? So one thing you want to make clear to your employees is that work policies still apply. So if something is brought up that would require an investigation any other time at work, just because you're in the quote unquote safe space doesn't mean that all of a sudden the policies are not going to be applied. So I would just make sure it's clear to employees that while this is an opportunity for speaking or having discussion, if there is something implicating a policy violation, it still would need to be investigated and looked into in accordance with company policies. Okay, I think that is all the time we have. Sorry for the questions we didn't get to, but we will be sending out an email with all the materials, the recording, and everything from today. All right, thanks everybody. Great, thanks guys.